challenges in the era of Internet of Things. And we have with us three very knowledgeable speakers who will tell us more about this topic today. Uh, my name is Samir Herlikar. I am one of the vice chairs of this chapter, along with N.P. Devakar, who is the session chair for today's event. Um, so uh, since we do have three speakers, uh, there will be a quite tight time budget, so I'll be, very, I'll be as brief as possible in these remarks. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Texas Instruments for uh, allowing us, our chapter, the facility of this uh, auditorium, free of charge. And uh, our sponsor over here uh, that for our chapter is Jim Weezer. He's over at the back over there. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, also to let you know that today's program will be available as a WebEx recording and we are very uh, thankful to TI for allowing us to use their WebEx facility to be able to uh, record this event on WebEx. Um, next, uh, I'd just like to quickly recognize the uh, chapter volunteers and officers who make events like this uh, possible. Uh, my co-vice chair is uh, MP Devakar, he's, he's over there waving his hand over there. Um, our chair, Saurabh Sureka, isn't in today. Um, <coughs> Treasurer Mehran is not here today as well either. Chapter Secretary is Amit Butala. He's waving his hand by the back. And there's Program Director, um, Stephanie Pereira. There she is. She was helping you sign in. Um, and also one of our Program Directors is Vishal Sharma. He's out here in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, Vishal and MP were the co-organizers for today's event. Uh, a couple of other announcements. Uh, those of you who have been to our events before will be very aware of the format of our events. Um, and also some of the TI security requirements. Uh, the TI security requires. Um, actually, before we get there, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, one of our very long-term uh, volunteers. And he is our uh, liaison with Global Comsoc. He is a former chair emeritus for our chapter. And he is, and he is manning the, the table at the back over there, which for IEEE memberships and so on. That's Alan Weisberger, he's over at the back. He's been a very long term member with IEEE Council of SCB. Um, so quickly, uh, TI Security requires us to, everybody, officers, volunteers, speakers, everyone, to uh, exit this building by 8.45 p.m. today. So this is a TI Security requirement, so we appreciate your cooperation and understanding for this. Um, and given the fact that we have three speakers, uh, we, we will not be taking we will not be taking any questions during the talks. After the three talks have concluded, we will have all three speakers on the stage for a moderated panel session, and that is when we will take your questions. So, if you have any questions, please hold them for the panel session. We will try to accommodate as many questions as possible. So that will be it. And next, I'd like to hand over the proceedings to the session chair for today, and be the work. Um, welcome. Uh, we have uh, we're very privileged to have three speakers here today. Uh, the patterns, uh, the emerging you know, issues on patterns in the Internet of Things, is going to be the area to watch for the next couple of years. It's going to bring in things that we didn't pick up before, both opportunities as well as challenges in developing products. So we have three speakers who will enlighten us today with more information on this. So leading the way, um, it will be Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Miller, um, Michelle, uh, the co-organizer co for this event. He will do the introduction, and then we'll come back and introduce the, the next two speakers as their turn comes up. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, this evening Jeff Miller. Uh, Jeff Miller is a patent attorney with extensive 20-year experience doing litigation, strategic patent, patent counseling uh, for both domestic and foreign patents. And he's had experience in diverse areas of technology, you know, spanning integrated circuits, wireless, telecommunications, uh, EDA, uh, and, uh, and packaging and fabrication. So pretty appropriate person to come talk to us about uh, what's going on in this uh, new era of the Internet of Things. And he's uh, been involved in a lot of strategic transactions, you know, totaling millions of dollars worldwide uh, for a number of different companies with different uh, clients and, and their assets. So I'd like to welcome him. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. We have my. Yeah. Ah, yes, thank you. Okay. 
So I'm going to talk briefly, now we don't have a lot of time, so I'll try to squeeze all this in. I wait far too many slides, and I am a lawyer as well, I like to talk. And so um, please, Michelle, I'll give me the hook when it's not my turn anymore. So I want to talk to you about uh, three things that I think are going to affect the, your IP strategy moving forward. And I'm going to bring up some topics that I think will be specifically important to uh, companies and startups in the Internet of Things space. And those three things um, are, many of you I'm sure know that we've had patent reform, reform, you know, Congress likes to attest the word reform to everything uh, that they do. I would just say that the, the big patent act that was passed in, in 2012, is really just patent change. It moved the deck chairs around, made some changes, it didn't really reform anything, but it made some very significant changes to the way patent law um, is going to be applied uh, going forward. So there's some new strategies under the AIA. Uh, the AIA is the big act, the American Defense Act. Then I want to talk about what I think, what I understand about the Unit of Things is going to be an important issue with your patents that you need to be aware of as you um, plot out your strategy and try to build a wall around what it is you're doing. So let's move to the next slide. So what is the American Defense Act? So it came in, a, it, it fully in effect in March of 2013. So we've got about almost two years of experience with it. And, and as you can imagine, the law moves at a glacial pace. And so there's a lot we don't know yet. We know what the statute says, but we do not know how the courts are going to interpret many things. But we can at a high level talk about the two major things that the AIA did. So the first thing it did uh, was it transformed the U.S. patent system from a first-to-invent system to a first-to-file system. And you might ask yourself why that's important. Well, I'm going to get into that, but basically the definition of prior art, uh, prior art being what, uh, you know, is what will give you the ability to get patents or um, will be used against you to say that your patents either are valid or you shouldn't be getting a patent at all, has changed. Um, and so that was the first thing that the AIA did. The second thing the patent the AIA did was it created some created um, a new regime to challenge the validity of patents. Some people call it post grant review, um, and it's really a misnomer because post grant review is actually one of the specific types of things you can do with an issued patent, but. The main thing that it did that's really important to you moving forward is that it created what's called an inter partes review. An inter partes review is a process whereby members of the public can challenge the validity of an issued patent at the patent office. So that there's no jury, there's no judge, you're not in court, you're at the patent office and presumably the patent office um, has far more experience with these things because with patents because they are in the patent office. All the judges are technically trained. I've done a fair number of these things and I can tell you firsthand that the judges are generally chosen to be in the space upon which you, um, the patents are applicable. So you're going to get a judge who's knowledgeable, knowledgeable technically. Um, there are other types of, of um, post grant review proceedings. We don't need to get into those because IPR is far more important. Why is that? Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. So, we don't need to do this. So, the one thing I wanted to stress about the massive change in the law is this first to file system that we're now in. It's first to file means that you are now in a race to the patent office. It used to be, um, up until a couple years ago, that the patent that the owner of a patent, or at least the inventor of a patent, was determined by who invented the subject matter first. And you, you can think to yourself, well, that seems fair, right? Uh, who, who did it first ought to get the patent. Well, you, the U.S., it, there were only two countries in the world that were operating under a first-to-invent system. It was us, and it was the Philippines. So we were in very small companies. So if you were operating, you know, a multinational company with, you know, operations in Europe and in Asia, you were sort of operating in a first to 
a file system anyway. But the U.S. is the big market, and that's where most patent enforcement is done. And so uh, companies and inventors, they could rely on that first to invent system, and they could tinker with their ideas, and they could you know, perfect it, and they would still be entitled to the patent rights. That's not true anymore. So you are now in a race to the patent office. So if you're working in a startup, you're going to have all kinds of pressure on you and to you know, get products out and you know, build, make your specs and everything else. There's one other thing that you need to be really aware of, which is that if you're in a, in a space that's crowded, other people are going to be filing patents and you're not going to be able to say, well, I did it first. That's not going to be a defense anymore. Um, and the other thing, and this is the other second uh, practice point I want to point out to you that the AI changed, was that it used to be yeah, I'm sure many of you who have been involved in the patent system know this. It used to be that there was a one-year grace period that effectively said that once you publicly disclose or put something on sale, you had a year to get to the patent office. Um, well, that's changed. And I can go through the intricacies of the statute, but because the one-year grace period is technically still in the law, but it's been so curtailed that it effectively doesn't exist. And you can see in the slide that I have up here, it's slide eight, that the grace period only applies to disclosure by disclosure by the inventor now. By the inventor now. It used to be that it was disclosures by anybody. Um, and so, um, effectively, when you tie that back in with the, we're in a first to file world, if you make a public disclosure, um, the only way the, the on sale, the, the grace period is going to help you is if you can prove in a future litigation that the person who filed before you did got the idea from you. <laughs> that is a massive change in the law. So not only are you in a race to the patent office to be the first inventor, but you're going to be in a race to the patent office because if someone, if you or someone you work with or someone in your company disposes something, um, it, the burden, of, the burden on you in the litigation to prove that whoever filed before you didn't get the idea from you is going to be difficult to prove. I, I do a lot of litigation, and I can tell you that it's there's no slam dunks in this world, and and when you're enforcing things, and so you want to make sure that you get your patents on file as early as possible. All right, so that is in a nutshell the things I wanted to point out to you about the American Invents Act. And I want to at, explain to you why I think the change in the law to first to file and the effective elimination of the grace period is important. And I said this before, but I'll say it again because it's on my slide, which is that you are in a race to the patent office. Um, uh, there's some data here from a report done by the UK Patent Office um, that actually MK provided to me, so um, it was actually a very interesting report, it was eye opening for me. Um, and I think that he even had this in the, in the going in a, in a loop uh, before I got to speak. But you can see, that, so the UK Patent Office, and I had the link on the slide, and I can go pull the whole report. Uh, the UK Patent Office did a study, and they tried to figure out how many Internet of Things patents are out there. And you can see that uh, there are about 10,000 patent families that they came up with, and I think this data is up through about 2013. Um, a patent family being, you know, if you file here and in Europe and in Asia, that would be a single family. So there's a lot of people getting patents in this space, and that number, as you can see in this slide, um, which has two different graphs from the, the UK Patent Office report, is the number of people filing is increasing ex exponentially. So this is becoming a crowded art in the various patent offices, and you need to, as you plan out your strategy and you start filing things, you need to understand that there's going to be your com potential competitors, including some very large companies, are getting patents. And you know, the analogy that I like to give to people about patents is that <laughs> patents are kind of like nuclear weapons. <laughs> Which is that my competitors got them, it means I gotta have them. Because if you get into a dust up with a competitor, 
you need to have something that you can point back in the direction uh, in, because that way you're in a mutually assured destruction position. So here's another uh, piece of data, and this, tells, this basically just explains which countries are heavily involved in getting patents in the Internet of Things space. So you can see China, the USA, and Korea are the top three, and then Japan is up there. But China and the US are, are really active in this area, which is perhaps not much of a surprise. So let's talk briefly about post-grant review. Because I talked to you about how it's important to get your, five, your patents on file, um, and to get as many of them as you can. Um, so that's a good thing, you know, building a wall around your business. So the next thing you need to understand is that the post-grant provisions that are, as part, are in the American Events Act, some would argue have weakened the, the um, strength of those patents. And that's because you can get, now people who want to challenge the validity of your patents can go into the patent office and get a knowledgeable um, uh, tribunal to take a second look at them. And there are a bunch of other proceedings to develop. They're not, at least I think, for as I understand this audience, they're not as important. So let's briefly talk about who can file an IPR. IPR stands for Interparties Review. Um, with rare exceptions, anybody can. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, anyone can do it. So if someone wants to harass you, they can file an IPR and challenge the validity of your IP. Um, you are somewhat circumscribed in what what you can challenge, you have to basically use prior art. Saying that they didn't disclose what they say they taught, you can't do that in the context of an IPR. Um, or they defrauded the patent office. None of that works at an IPR. But you can challenge on anticipation and obviousness based on prior art. Um, and you can only use printed publications. So if you want to come in and say, well, Texas Instruments sold this chip 10 years before you filed your patent, that's not going to work. You're going to have to find either an article that TI wrote, a data sheet, or a patent that they file. Now, one of the reasons or rationales that people have for filing IPRs, and one of the reasons you should be afraid of them if you have patents, is that the burden of proof is lower than it is in a district court. So when you sue somebody for patent infringement, and you want to invalidate their patent, you have to do that with what we call, lawyers call it clear and convincing evidence, which is a pretty high standard. Um, that clear and convincing evidentiary standard does not apply at the patent office. It's the standard preponderance of the evidence standard, which is, you know, is it more likely than not? Which is, you know, in the scheme of things, is, you know, is it 52, 55 percent um, likely that the, the claim is invalid? Um, now, something to keep in mind if you want to actually go out and file one of these IPRs is that there is a potential downside, which is that if under the law, if you file an IPR and you lose, you cannot raise another defense in any district court litigation. And the statute says that you uh, could have raised. We unfortunately don't know what that means yet because the courts haven't addressed it. But it's something to keep in mind. And what I would say is, and I've done a bunch of these IPRs at this point, is that if you're not entitled to invalidate a claim at the patent office, you're probably better off not filing an IPR because you're not going to win and then you're going to have this issue that lawyers call estoppel, which is going to prevent you from making a decent prior art defense in any district court litigation. So if you have a great prior art defense, you shouldn't be afraid of the patent office, but if it's only mediocre, you need to be careful. So why do I talk about IPRs? A lot of you probably work with startups and you're like, well, you know, this is somewhat down the road. <coughs> for us, if at all. Well, as you can see, this is from data from the Patent Office. It's very recent. This is January 29th of this year. When the Patent Office proposed their regulations and they had fee-setting authority, they had to say, okay, this is how many IPRs we think we're going to have to handle every year. And I, I think they said they were going to get like two or two or three hundred of them. Well, they've had thousands of them. Um, and it's only getting more popular. And one of the reasons it's become popular is that it's been effective. Because the patent office is taking their job seriously and they are invalidating claims that should never have been granted. So this is important. Um, and you can, 
this is another slide that I got off the Patent Office website that shows you the technological breakdown, and you can see the blue one is in the electrical computer area, which is where you guys are. So it's been very popular. I've, I have files, you know, many of them, and the results have been pretty good. So um, what, is this, what is this takeaway for you guys, which is that there are now, if you're a startup and you have to battle <coughs> a Texas Instruments, let's say, or any big company, there are now some cost-effective measures that you have to defend yourself, um, which is this IPR pr process. They, so they do level the playing field a bit. Um, I, mean, I mean, it works both ways, right? Because if you have a patent and you want to enforce it against some, another company, they have this ability to go to the patent office as well to challenge your patents. So I'm almost done. I wanted to just bring up one issue that I want you guys to be aware of. Because um, I think it's um, a particularly important issue in the Internet of Things space. And that's what patent lawyers like to call binding infringement. So I think most of you probably know what a patent claim is. A patent claim says, you know, I claim A, B, C, and D. Um, or, uh, you know, I claim a method of doing, you know, you know turning on my car, you know, <coughs> putting the car into reverse, uh, excuse me, backing out. And, you know, pulling onto the expressway, you know, method claim. Um, so in the Internet of Things space, there's going to be a lot of patents that are going to be talking about a lot of interoperability issues, right? Because the whole idea is that we're, you know, we're becoming part of a network and we're, um, you know, going to be interacting with other entities. Um, and so the patent claims are going to be directed to this. Well, as you're plotting out your intellectual property strategy, it's important to keep a couple of things in mind, which is that your, the claims of that patent need to be focused on a single um, entity, for, for lack of a better word. In other words, you can't have claims that claim a cell tower and a cell phone. Um, and why is that? Well, that's because the cell tower is not the user, and the cell phone is not the, cell you know, is not the network provider, is an example. And under the law, and it's evolving a little bit, and we don't know everything, but it, one thing is pretty clear is that if you can't prove that, that a single entity is the infringer of your claim, then you've got to divide the infringement problem. And there's a, a recent, is six months ago, Supreme Court case that has upheld this defense to infringement. It's particularly important with what we call method claims and inducement claims. I put up the code up here, and we got lawyers there. And read it. Um, but this Limelight versus Akamai case, the Supreme Court case from last, this, um, last spring, basically said there has to be a single actor that performs all the elements of a claim before you can have an inducement claim. And remember, you know, for, if you take like an exercise um, band, like a Fitbit kind of thing, and the, that device is going to be, first of all, going to be used by a customer. And it's going to be interacting with your, your iPhone and your Android phone. And if you have patent claims that are covered, that are directed to that interoperability, you need to make sure that the claims are directed with a frame of reference from a Fitbit's perspective. Because mm -hmm. if you start talk, claiming, of, this is a patent attorney word, but if you start positively claiming the cell phone or whatever else is being interacted with, you potentially have a patent that is of no value. So that's all I have. I guess we'll be doing questions later, so. Thank you, Jeff. Um, our next speaker, uh, she will be talking about the issues on open sources, open source uh, type codes and the way we use them. In inter Internet of Things gadgets, um, Gwen Gwen Murray, uh, she's been a, I think very, uh, I would say uh, a very familiar uh, player in the, the IP in the Silicon Valley. Um, she's worked at Apple, uh, Silicon Graphics among uh, well-known companies. Now she runs her own practice, and uh, without saying <laughs> much further, I will introduce Gwen to the podium. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So 
and I apologize if I cough for you. Before I get started, I wanted to get a sense of who was in the room in terms of who here is primarily a software engineer or software developer. Okay, the rest are very much hardware folks. Okay, and who in the room is familiar with or working regularly with open source software? So I, I don't want to talk down to you, but what I thought I would do today, um, I'm not talking about patents except for one slide, I think, is to talk about the basics of open source software licensing, just to give you an overview, and then talk uh, in some more detail about a couple of open source license provisions and requirements that I think are particularly pertinent to the area of the Internet of Things. So just in case there's anyone in the room who doesn't know this, let me just start out by saying what is open source? O open source software. In software language, there is uh, source code, which is the human readable, writable code that can be edited and modified, versus the compiled code or object code or binary code, which is machine readable. And so one of the, the particular belief systems or tenets behind free and open source software is the notion that software being readable and writable is speech and should be open and free with, so that people can have access to it, modify it, distribute it, things like that. Within the realm of what I'll call open source, what some people call it free, free software, or FLOSS, free libre, um, there are, there's a range of different types of licenses. And I like to put these in uh, three buckets for ease of, of consideration. Um, one of them, being what I call a permissive or attribution software license. And that essentially says, here's my source code, here's my code, you can take it in source code form, you can modify it, you can create derivative works, you can redistribute it, you can do whatever you like with it. And you can redistribute it under other licenses with certain requirements. On the other extreme are licenses that I call copyleft licenses. And some people call these reciprocal or viral or contaminatory licenses. These are licenses like the GNU General Public License. And well, GPL is the best example. Um, and these say, if you bring my code, or here's my source code, you can have my source code, you can use it, you can modify it, but if you distribute it, you have to distribute it under the same terms as this license. And one of the terms of this license, by the way, is that source code is available. So essentially what a copyleft license is saying is you bring it under, in under GPL, you modify it, you ship it out. It has to go out under GPL, including any modifications or assuming you've created a, a derivative work. And you must make not only the original code, but your modifications available publicly in source code form. So as you can imagine, this kind of license can be very scary for industries or companies that are trying to develop software and keep it closed or proprietary and license it under a closed source license. Um, and a big part of what I do in my daily practice is work with companies on uh, how are they using software like this? Are they modifying it? If they're modifying it, have they created a der derivative work? If so, what chunk of software do they need to make available in source code form versus what part of their software product can they keep closed from the, the general public? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in the middle is kind of a hybrid of those two kinds of licenses. I call this file-based copyleft licenses. Examples of these kinds of licenses are the Mozilla public license, the Eclipse public license, and there are a number of others. But what these say, they're, they're essentially copyleft licenses, but they're much clearer in stating their intent to be that if you bring in Mozilla code or Eclipse code, you have to, upon distribution, make that code available under Mozilla or Eclipse and keep the source code open. But they're much more explicit about saying, if you create your own module or your own application, that module or application can be licensed however you want. So it's, it's really, it's just much clearer in terms of the licensing term and um, as a result, much less frightening to, to industry. So I talked a little bit about what are copyleft and reciprocal licenses. As I said, if you bring it in under the GPL or another copyleft license, it's gotta go out under the GPL. 
or another copyleft license. Examples are the GPL, the Afero GPL, and the LGPL. Now, a lot of people in my practice, I come across lots of software developers who will say, oh, LGPL, meaning the lesser general public license, is a safe license. Because as with file-based copyleft licenses, it is the original intent between creating that, that license was to make it friendlier to business and to make it easier to use LGPL code in a proprietary or closed source application. I actually don't agree that it's much different from the GPL, um, and I discuss this with my colleagues quite often, but essentially what it comes down to in any of these situations is are you creating a derivative work of the copylefted code or not? And if you are, that everything in that derivative work needs to be made available in the source code form. One note, um, there's sometimes confusion when I use the term copyleft. Some people think that I'm talking about the opposite of copyright. That is not true. Um, it's kind of an unfortunate term that's come around. I didn't invent it, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but copyleft, you can't have copyleft without having copyright. So you need, when you write code or create, you know, write a book, you own the copyright in that creation. You then can decide how to license it. And copyleft <coughs> simply means that you're licensing it under a license that requires that the code that is being distributed downstream be licensed under the same license. So you can't, you can't license something unless you have the copyright to it. So I just that's a point of confusion sometimes. So what is the GPL? Um, it is by far the most widely used free and open source software license. Last time I checked, about three quarters of all software packages, free software was, was distributed under the GPL. Um, and I've put up here, <coughs> excuse me, one of the core provisions of GPL version 2.0 which basically says what I said earlier, that if you distribute, any, you must cause any work that you distribute or publish that either is in whole or contains or is derived from the GPL program to be distributed as a whole at no charge <coughs> under the terms of this license, meaning source code must be made available. Um, in 2007, there were two new versions of the GPL and LGPL and AGPL that came out. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as I think they're particularly relevant to IoT. The LGPL, I, I said a little bit about this earlier. Um, it was originally designed to kind of more explicitly allow linking of non-GPL or, or LGPL libraries into non-free programs. Um, but as I mentioned, in my view, the, the legal analysis is exactly the same. If you've created a derivative work of LGPL code, you need to release that derivative work under the LGPL um, including source code available, making source code available. Um, and the other, another analysis that comes up here is, are you distributing the code? Because again, as I think I mentioned earlier, all of these licenses, if all you're doing is using the code and using it internally, and even modifying it internally, there is no license compliance requirement. And I, in fact, I can't think of any free or open source license that has any license requirement in that case. But if you've created a derivative work and you're distributing, then you must make the source code available. There's some debate that I think is kind of starting to go away around whether using LGPL code, statically linking code, um, meaning kind of embedding it into your software program versus dynamically linking it so that the end user is, hits a button at runtime and, and you're accessing the code at runtime. There's different analysis about whether those two kinds of linking um, have different effects in terms of the creation of the derivative work or not. Many people argue, and industry practice pretty much is, that if you're dynamically linking post-distribution at runtime, you have not created a derivative work. Whereas if you've statically linked prior to distribution, you probably are. But this is, one thing I should have said earlier is that there is almost no law, a case law, around open source software at this point. So everything I'm talking about is pretty much what people in the community think, how industry is interpreting it. There have been a couple of decisions, um, a couple of lawsuits, mostly in Europe, but essentially no one has, no court has yet started analyzing these licenses and telling us what they mean. So it's a fun area of practice. So I talked a little bit earlier, permissive or academic licenses, 
examples would be the BSD license, MIT license, Apache license, Zlib, Boost, there are a number of others. Um, these ones, as I mentioned, allow you to bring in code that's under one of these licenses and essentially do whatever you want with it. Um, you can charge money for it, you can create entirely new programs, um, and um, I, I think I say this later, but I'll, I'll say it now. The one caveat with this is that people often think, oh, it's a permissive license, I don't have to do anything, I can just use it. That's not true. Almost every free, or in fact, I again, every free and open source license that I know of requires that you give credit where credit is due. And if you redistribute, you must um, provide the name of the copyright holder or copyright holders and a copy of the original permissive license. So that's one of the things that comes up in IoT. So there are compliance requirements with permissive licenses. They're just not as onerous. Um, example of a permissive license is the BSD license. And here's kind of the core language saying redistribution and use in source and binary, binary forms with or without modification are permitted. So do what you want, but you must give proper attribution. So these I talked about. Oh, one other point is that some of, uh, something that comes up in my practice quite a bit is that there are some compatibility issues. So although BSD and Apache and licenses like that say essentially you can do whatever you want with this stuff, you can ship it out under another license. There are some BSD and other licenses that although they're, they're called permissive licenses, actually conflict with other free and open source software licenses. So for example, there are the BSD three clause and four clause licenses that include um, provisions like thou shalt not use the copyright holder's name for advertising purposes. That actually conflicts with GPL2. So you could not bring BSD3 clause or 4 clause code in and ship it out as GPL2. So it's just something to be aware of that there may be some compatibility issues. So what, what's kind of the overwhel overwhelming theme here? Number one, as I mentioned, give credit where credit is due. Free and open source software um, developers often really, they're in it for their reputation, they're in it to write great code, they want recognition. And it, it will look very badly, uh, you know, people will look badly upon you if you don't acknowledge their contribution or claim that you wrote something you didn't. Um, the other thing which I've already mentioned is that license compliance requirements are triggered by distribution. In dealing with my clients, I have a lot of people say, well, it, it only matters if I've modified it, right? No. What matters is, are you distributing or not? Up until the point of distribution, you don't have to do anything. But then we talk about what is distribution. So, um, talked a little bit about this, I'm trying to think. There are a bunch of different varieties of GPL and LGPL code. There are some exceptions, such as the class path exception, that essentially make the GPL a little more permissive under some circumstances. Um, one thing to watch for if you are using GPL code is look for, is it GPL 2.0 only, or GPL 3.0 only, or does it say GPL 2.0 or later license? Because that can start having impact on your license notice requirements and also compatibility issues. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that I am very careful when I'm working with clients and putting together their lists of open source software. I try to make sure that they are tracking version numbers and date of download so that they know exactly what the term, the specific version of their the open source license applies, um, keeping records of that because the licenses can change and, and GPL 2.0, GPL 3.0, 3.0 you know, have different, different requirements. Um, talk a little bit more about, this is where we get into uh, how does this affect the Internet of Things. Um, GPL 3 was written, um, actually it's a little bit of background, GPL 1 and GPL 2 were written almost entirely by software developers. And when I first started practicing, I read them and I thought, I don't understand any of this. It's gobbledygook, you know, why couldn't a lawyer have written this? Um, they're highly technical. And, and somewhat ambiguous. GPL3 was written in hopes of clarifying GPL2, 
and it was written by numerous like, panels of lawyers all over the world. I was not involved in this. <laughs> and in, as a result, it is even more difficult to understand than GPL 2.0. Um, <laughs> it is really kind of a bear of a license, and you know, I read it over and over and over, and, and still having to go back and read it again. But what's relevant about GPL 3 in the Internet of Things, and in terms of devices, GPL 3 includes two provisions. One is an anti-DRM provision, and one is an anti-TiVoization provision. Um, they also include explicit patent licenses and patent termination clauses that were not explicit in prior versions. And indeed, uh, there are a few licenses that have, uh, other licenses that have such patent clauses, but not a lot. Um, and HEPL, the Afero GPL, is even goes even further than, than GPL 3.0 in that it says that if you are operating software as a service, so you're operating a web service, and, you're op and the code you're running to operate your service is a GPL, the fact that you're running a service is a distribution, and you need to make your source code available. So that's, that's something, I mean, I basically tell most of my clients, just run away screaming from AGPL, because if by any chance you're using any AGPL code to run a, a web service, that's going to constitute a dis distribution, and you need to make your source code available. So that's a fun one. That's a whole other topic. But, um, and I'll go into a little bit more of these provisions, the anti-DRM provision. As I mentioned, all FOSS licenses do require license notice and copyright attribution upon distribution. The question, one question is, what is a distribution? I mean, it's one thing in the old traditional software model where you write up some software, you license it out, you get some money for that you know, on a per seat basis or whatever. But what if you are running a web service? Or what if you are using subcontractors for code creation? Um, what if you're distributing to affiliated companies, not you know, in a multinational? There is absolutely no case law telling us whether those things are or are not a distribution. Some of the licenses are explicit around this, some of them are not. But with respect to this license compliance requirement, um, many companies are using a lot of open source software. And in fact, if you go on your phone and you look in your the legal file in the about part, you are likely to find a legal file that has a list of probably hundreds, if not thousands, of third party software components and their associated license licenses. goes on and on. So question, how do you do this in a device, for example? How do you do it in a car if you're using open source software to run a car? And you're supposedly giving the end user the ability to know what open source software is in that car. Do you put it in the owner's manual? Do you have a website? Um, some licenses are very specific about what, how you give the notice. But increasingly, as technology develops, people become more mobile. Um, IoT develops, there's really no clear answer on how we do these things. So at this point, you know, I'm working with clients on a case-by-case -case basis to try to figure out what works, what is reasonable. But there's really no, no model yet for how to do that. How do you do it with a web service? That's probably easier because you can, you can have a page on your website or something you can point people to. But you know, another example would be a pacemaker or some kind of um, human medical device that is monitored from afar, and that there's open source software being used in that, being transmitted from a server to the device. Is that a distribution? Probably. Um, and how do you give the pacemaker wearer or holder or owner the, uh, a copy of all this software, assuming they even care, which they probably don't. But the rules are rules. So just to finish up, um, the I, I was talking about some of the new provisions in GPL 3. Here are a couple of them, and uh, again, kind of clear as mud, and probably my patent colleagues will have some, some things to say about this. Um, so the first one is an anti-DRM clause. And let me back up. The reason that these, these, some of these provisions are in GPL 3 are because, essentially, of the company TiVo. TiVo, you've heard the company, has boxes that run on or ran on Linux. And TiVo was very open about the fact that they were using Linux, but they, they were selling boxes that were closed. So people, users, couldn't get into the boxes and re-engineer the software or find out what was in there. 
And this made the Free Software Foundation and other open source, free and open source advocates very angry. So what they tried to do with GPL3 was to prevent that kind of action. So first of all, saying here in section three, um, if you are using GPL3 code to in a product where you're saying you cannot reverse engineer, you can't do that. Um, you cannot forbid circumvention of technological measures. That one is not as worrying to me for the purposes of IoT as Section 6. Section 6 says if you convey, if, if you're distributing a work in object code or whatever, that is a user product, then you must essentially allow the end user to reverse engineer, to open up the box and swap out code and um, you know, modify it. So uh, the one exception is it does not apply if neither you or any third party has the ability to install modified object code. So there's a little exception there. But what, what's a user product? So here they're saying a user product is either a consumer product, so tangible personal property, which is normally used for personal, family, or household purposes, or anything designed or sold for incorporation into a dwelling. So what's a user product? Is a pacemaker a user product? Is a router a user product? I mean, I know some, some networking companies who a few years ago were only selling to, to industry, but now their products are going into people's houses. It's probably a user product. And they have every reason to want to keep those boxes sealed for security reasons. So this provision is a real problem for companies like that. Another question is, what's a dwelling? Um, I mean, a house or an apartment would seem to be a dwelling, but is an, apart is an apartment building or a hotel or a hospital a dwelling? Nobody knows. So this is where the GPL3, GPL3 is really fun. Um, and this, this provision in particular, I think is one that is, is problematic for IoT because we're going to be having devices that people are wanna, gonna wanna keep locked that likely are going to be running with open source code. And, and this provision is something really important to be aware of. Um, so this is just discussion of what is installation information. And I think I'm over my time, so I will move on. The, the one other point here is that GPL3, along with a couple of other licenses like the Apache license and Mozilla, do have explicit patent license terms where when you license your code, or it, like if you use GPL code in your product and redistribute it, you are either waiving your right to, to enforce patent claims covered in that product, or you must make all your source code available. Um, and there are some per patent termination provisions here also that can kick in. I think I'm over time, so I'm gonna say thank you and take questions later, thank you. So I'll just introduce uh, Alicia Starr here, who's uh, our third speaker for the day. And Alicia comes to us from Altera Corporation. She's uh, director of intellectual property there. And her group is responsible for a lot of different things, all the way from patent you know, prosecution to patent litigation, trademarks, copyrights, licensing, and uh, open source software. So uh, she's going to talk to us about uh, maybe uh, uh, her perspective uh, on, on what uh, all of these legal uh, sort of machinations mean for the Internet of Things creation. Hi. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, let me just make sure I have all the Okay. Uh, my name is Alicia Shaw. I'm the new director of intellectual property law at Altera Corporation. Altera makes fully programmable gate arrays would make programmable semiconductors. Uh, the hardware and the software used to place and route on our semiconductors. And in my first few months, and it is my first few months at Altera, I'm constantly hearing about the Internet of Things. We're talking about it at Altera. We're talking about our business partners are talking about it. Probably our competitors are talking about it. Hopefully not. Um, <laughs> and the thing that comes to mind when I hear about the Internet of Things as a lawyer is Alice. I go, oh my gosh, what about Alice? And so that's what I want to talk with you about today is Alice versus CLS Bank. It's a recent Supreme Court case that came out this year uh, about patentable inventions and what it means and the confines of what it means to get a patent. But before I do that, I'm going to talk to you about 
my idea. Uh, when I was in college, I went to college in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And Ann Arbor is a, a big college town. I know Michigan Wolverines, maybe there, maybe we've heard of them. And uh, the, the college is kind of the center of the town, and then there's these old dilapidated houses just surrounding campus where the students live. And I was one of those students living in a dilapidated campus house. And uh, the washer and the dryer are in the basement, and it smells and it's dirty. And I would go down there as a college kid, and I'd stick my clothes in the washer, and then I'd come up, and I'd be like hanging out with my friends, and drinking and watching movies, who knows what we're doing in college, wasting time. And um, I would forget to put my clothes in the dryer for like three hours or two days or whoever knows in college. And they would get all moldy. And I would always be thinking my great idea in college was, how come I don't have a dryer that talks to my washer? And my washer can say, I'm done washing the clothes now. And my dryer can say, great, let me grab those and just go into the dryer so that they don't get all moldy. And this was, you know, this was eons ago, so that was a huge invention. I just thought it was great. And now I realize that my washer and my dryer could talk to my cell phone and they could know that my last meeting is going to end in an hour. So get the washing started so the drying's almost done when I get home, the internet of things. I had no idea uh, what was going to come about. And, I want to talk about that idea just because I, as I think about it in the Alice framework, we can, we can think about you know, these big ideas versus what's going to be patentable under Alice. So uh, now that we've talked about my great ideas from my college days, uh, let's talk about the law. The law is this. You're looking at uh, up here at the top, 35 USC section 101. USC stands for US code. And it really starts at 101, so this is the start of it. It says, whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, and we can question that useful, I think we've all seen the inventions for exercising cats with lasers. Um, <laughs> machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof may obtain a patent therefore. And then this lawyer says it's subject to the conditions and requirements of this title. And, and the conditions and requirements really are that you have to uh, fill out some paperwork and get a patent, and then you have to bicker back. You guys like Jeff have to bicker back and forth with the patent office and try to convince them that this is a new novel idea. And then you have to pay a fee. That's certainly a condition as well. Uh, and Atlas came out in 2014, just this past summer, and they talked about an exception. And they said, laws of nature, natural phenomenon, and abstract ideas are not patentable. You cannot patent those things. And SCOTUS said we mean it this time, and you're saying, what the heck is SCOTUS? And this is just something that I'm going to do to you, because since I've been at Altera, I have heard 2,000 acronyms, and so I'm going to just have my own. <laughs> SCOTUS means Supreme Court of the United States from the lawyers here. Um, they said, we have long held that laws of nature, natural phenomenon, and abstract ideas are not uh, patentable. We've been talking about this for 150 years. And I think what they mean there is we mean it this time, guys. Quit trying to get patents on these things. We're going to invalidate them. And then they march through in the Alice decision all the different case law. And the first one, Parker v. Fluke, and this isn't the first one. I didn't, I didn't walk you guys through all 150 years. I'm between you and pizza, and I know that that would be miserable. Uh, they have this formula for computing alarm conditions in a catalytic converter. And they said, OK, if, if this chemical, I'm not a chemical engineer, so that if this chemical gets too high, have the alarm go off in the car. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's a, just math. That's just natural phenomenon. You can't patent that. Uh, then these guys, Bilski versus Kapos, came out. And actually, they had kind of this convoluted scheme for hedging risk by buying certain assets and buying other assets. And they were trying to uh, keep prices. If prices went up, they could hedge their risk. And they were doing this all on the computer. And the, Supreme Court said, no, that's not patentable. And they said, but we put it on a computer. That's technology. And the Supreme <laughs> Court said, no, just because you were doing something people have been doing to hedge risk for a while with a computer, that's not patentable. Uh, Mayo then came out in 2012. They were uh, measuring blood metabolites in hospital patients. And then they were using a computer to calculate the dosage uh, that someone would need for this medical condition. And the Supreme Court said, that's not patentable. People have been measuring metabolites and calibrating dosages without a computer for eons. 
Uh, because you're doing it all in one step with a computer, that's not patentable. And then finally, we came to 2014 Alice. And in Alice, uh, the idea was that, uh, let's say I have a company and I want to sell uh, this guy here some stock and he's going to pay me. And, and he's going to give me 500 bucks. And I'm not sure I want to give him my stock until he gives me my 500 bucks. And he's not sure he wants to give me his 500 bucks until I give him my stock. And so we choose a neutral. Say, OK, everybody, I'll give you my stock. You give me the 500 bucks. And, and, and once you, know, you have both parties, we can, we can, you can do the switch over. And they said, we're, we're going to do that with a computer. That intermediary or that third party can be a computer. And the Supreme Court said, no. No, that's not patentable. I think uh, Alicia was doing that when she was five years old, trading jelly beans with her cousins. Uh, you can't use a computer to do that. And so the important part for the Internet of Things, because none of these really relate to the Internet of Things, is how did they come to this decision? And it's a two-part test. The first part is determine whether the claims at issue are directed to patent ineligible concepts. And these are the things that we looked at, these abstract categories, economic practices. Are we just looking at economic fundamental practices and trying to do them with technology? Are we organizing human activity? Or is it just an idea itself? Is it just, you, do you just have a big idea? So going back to my washing machine, uh, at 20, my idea was just I'm going to have this washer, and it's going to use a computer. It's going to talk to the dryer. And the clothes are going to move when the washer's all done. And I think if we applied that first part of the test, the Supreme Court would say no. I, I, you're not going to be able, Alicia, to claim a washer that talks to a dryer uh, with the computer in order to get the clothes dried once they're done washing. They're going to say that's it may be organizing human activity. That's just you know cutting you out and using a computer. Or it's just the idea itself. You haven't done the hard work in the engineering to get a patent yet. Uh, but the Supreme Court gives me a second chance, and this is the second part of the test if you fail the first one. Then the Supreme Court will search for an inventive concept. And that means that they'll look for an, an element itself or a combination of elements, and these are the claim elements in the patent, that are sufficient to ensure basically that you can get a patent on the concept itself. And they're very clear here that, that just reciting a generic computer cannot turn something that was not patent eligible into patent eligible. So we're looking at my washing machine, and so far I haven't figured anything out. Say, oh, we just use a computer to do it. How hard can it be? I think the Supreme Court's going to say no. And so what are we going to do as, as lawyers and engineers as we think about the Internet of Things? And I want to say it's, it's really, at least from what I've heard, it's, it's in the start. I, wanna, I want my phone to talk to my car, and that's in some ways, that's as far as we've gotten, and in other ways, it's, we've gotten much further. I think what we need to think about is that patentable claims are not going to just recite a business practice um, from the pre-internet world, along with the requirement to perform it on the internet. Uh, my washing machine and my dryer are going to talk over the internet. That's cool. They weren't doing that before. We're not going to be able to do that. But what I think you will be able to patent, and this is this is me predicting the future, no court has said this, uh, is maybe you can talk about the infrastructure and the implementation of that. And as I think about my washer and dryer, I think about uh, sensing technology, I think about power. I don't want a sensor on my washer that's on all the time. You know, I'm going to kill my power bill. I think about communication standards and protocols, methods of transmission. Those are the kind of things where I think the patents are going to be found in those big ideas with the Internet of Things. The other place um, that I think you'll be able to find patents is that if you find things rooted in computer technology, so you're coming up with solutions to uh, problems that kind of came from technology itself. And this is the idea that uh, my phone is going to send to my washer, Alicia's leaving home in an hour, and I don't want the world to know that. Um, and so I need to encrypt it. I need public key cryptography, or I need some kind of encryption of my personal calendar data. Uh, otherwise, my husband will be calling, oh, you're here on the way home. Can you pick up some apples at the grocery store? You know? <laughs> um, so I think security, that's a problem that's unique to these kind of problems. If, if my car is talking to another device, encryption, um, security, web security, that's a place that you can find patents in this post-Alice world. And then before I say thank you, I want to list the other way 
that you can uh, keep protect your ideas in the post Alice world if you just have the idea of a washer and dryer that talk together. Because in this Internet of Things world, sometimes right now, that's all we have. And the answer is keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trade secret. That's the other way that you can protect your ideas. You don't necessarily have to have a patent in order to protect an idea. If you have a big idea and you haven't worked out the nitty gritty, keep it to yourself. Ask people to sign NDAs. Thanks.